please. Uh, oh, okay, I should go. Okay. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, welcome again. Uh, so uh, I have to say I was really inspired by this cartoon that Eva showed yesterday with the guy going to heaven and still not understanding quantization. So so my, my first thought was that, well, it means that everybody who understands quantization goes to hell. Uh, I, I leave that out there. So uh, it's probably uh, because, uh, well, as they say, the devil's in the detail. So uh, we are definitely going into the detail. And after the question about um, global hyperbolicity yesterday, I actually uh, did my homework. I hope that everybody does their homework. So uh, let me start with this story. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, all right. So uh, I did a thorough search in the literature to find um, what exact definition of closed causal curves that excludes uh, the rather pathological examples given. Um, and it turned out that the literature is not as consistent as one could hope. Um, so here are the things I looked at. So there is uh, the main paper of Bernal and Sanchez, which uh, has a lot about uh, global hyperbolicity. And um, it references, for example, these two standard textbooks, so O'Neill and Beam and Ehrlich. And I have to say, these are really good references. So uh, if you want to find out more about Lorentzian geometry, uh, or in other words, semi-Romanian geometry, th these are very good references. However, they are a bit sketchy about uh, what, what they actually mean by uh, the time lag curves, causal curves, and uh, things like that. So uh, I conferred with my colleagues in York, and we came up with um, a, a consistent version of things that more or less covers all the bases in the literature. So uh, this is sort of our interpretation of what's written there. Okay, so let me start with going through the notes. I will make them available. So first of all, um, well, part of uh, the trick is already hidden in how we want to define a smooth curve. So a good way to define a smooth curve for this purpose is to see it as a smooth map from an open interval um, in reals to the manifold. So that already excludes uh, the, the sort of uh, pathological situation where I would be just a point. So a point is not good enough. Um, so it's a map from an open interval to the manifold, um, which is um, in infinitely many times differentiable, so smooth map uh, with non-vanishing derivative. So, so this is a useful thing because then it excludes uh, the ex counterexample from yesterday um, that the curve uh, goes into the future, stops, and then goes back. So that's excluded. So that won't be a smooth curve. Okay, uh, but that's not the end of the story because we often need uh, piecewise smooth curves. So, and if you look into that literature, then you will find that you know, people are going between smooth and piecewise smooth as if nothing happened. Um, so uh, is that a thing? Uh, because for a piecewise smooth curve, uh, obviously that would uh, be allowed. Now, uh, however, for a piecewise smooth curve, one uh, assumes uh, silently, or let's assume explicitly, that uh, for a curve to be causal, uh, or time like we want uh, the time orientation to be kept uh, along the curve. So uh, here is uh, the statement. Sorry, there, there are some questions in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so here is the statement which kind of makes it clear that uh, it doesn't matter whether we take smooth curves or piecewise smooth curves that are. Uh, future directed or past directed, but they have, they keep their time orientation, okay? So uh, it turns out, and uh, you can try to prove it on your own on, or look into the literature, that uh, if you have two points uh, joined by a smooth curve, which is future directed uh, time lag or future directed causal, it's the same as having the, them joined by a piecewise smooth curve. So. This is a useful fact. So it doesn't really matter whether we formulate everything 
in terms of smooth future directed or piecewise smooth future directed. But then future directed is, is important because otherwise we have this pathological example. Okay, so, so that, that was one finding from the literature. Um, and then uh, obviously there's the definition of global hyperbolicity, uh, which in particular implies that that space time has no closed causal curves, see above, right? So, and here we mean uh, smooth uh, curves or piecewise smooth, but keeping their time orientation fixed, okay? Um, and then there's the definition of a Cauchy surface. And um, I slightly changed my convention in the lecture. So initially I said, uh, well, uh, intersected by every inextendable causal curve, but I think it's better to go with uh, a more uh, commonly used definition um, that it's intersected by every inextendable time-like curve, exactly once. So this is, uh, sort of clean and <laughs> uh, unproblematic. Uh, and then there is a result uh, that kind of shows um, equivalence with another definition, uh, but, but then it's, it's a bit uh, more tricky because if you are talking about uh, intersections by causal curves, then you have to say at least once. So maybe that's not as beautiful. Uh, and, and here is an example that if you have, uh, so, so this is in Minkowski, if you have um, a hypersurface, well, this guy is not smooth, but it doesn't matter. So, so you have uh, a segment which is null. So there is a null segment here. We want this to be, <clears throat> sorry, we want this to be a Cauchy surface, but it has a whole null segment. So you can imagine a causal uh, curve that would just go um, along that segment. So it would have a sort of singular intersection right here. So I, I changed that in the notes and I will update the notes soon and I will make that available as well. Um, and then uh, there is this theorem of Bernal Sanchez, which uh, shows the equivalence of uh, various notions of global hyperbolicity. So this is in this reference and uh, I refer everybody to um, this literature with the caveats I uh, made here. So uh, if you're if you're bothered by the fact that uh, you know piecewise smooth and smooth is just going around like crazy, uh, just refer to these notes and this this should help. Um, okay, any more questions to that? Okay. I take it as a no or, um, <laughs> or, or only look is away. Okay. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. So let me go back to uh, the main lecture and uh, let's see. So, yeah. So I made this change here with the definition of the Cauchy surface. Ah, I cannot find it anymore, but it's somewhere here. Ah, time like here. So, so uh, I changed this to, to time like. Um, just, just to avoid uh, a complication. And this is where we finished. So I defined that uh, category of uh, Poisson algebras, chain complexes in Poisson algebras. And the thing which I didn't manage to write because my computer refused cooperation um, was the definition of, um, well, uh, Algebras, uh, formal power series in H bar with coefficients in differential graded topological algebras. So that's going to be uh, the category for the quantum theory. And this is the statement of the definition what's a quantum theory model. So it's a functor from these causally convex subsets of a fixed manifold into. Um, this, this category of algebras. And again, we want causality and time size axiom on homology level. Um, there was the question about states <clears throat> and I decided to come back to it actually briefly later on, uh, but just to say that our current understanding of how states work, <laughs> uh, we are able to construct states um, on the uh, homology or cohomology level. So, 
um, this sort of framework I'm presenting here is a framework for constructing the algebra of observables. And then, uh, well, you have the slightly larger thing given by this differential graded algebra. Uh, you have the actual physical observables on the cohomology level. And this is where you construct states because states are something uh, physical. Now, it, it's reasonable to expect that there is some uh, nice extension of the notion of a state to, to, to this higher level, but uh, that's still a bit uh, shaky in places. So, I'm not, I'm not going to, to, to delve into this because um, I don't think we understand it entirely. Okay, and I also put here a reference to um, my paper with Owen William, uh, where there is more detail about the category theory side of things, and there is the relation to factorization algebras. Um, so that might be useful for some of you. So these are the additions, and uh, yeah, so let's get started with uh, the actual uh, explicit construction of things. So, so, so you know what I'm trying to construct and I will spend uh, the, the, the rest of uh, this lecture series constructing it because that's actually not trivial. So the next uh, topic is going to be uh, explicit construction. And I will start here with uh, classical theory. And in particular, I will start with uh, setting up the stage. So something you can think of as kinematical structure. So no dynamics yet. Um, so, okay, we have the fixed manifold M and on that, I also want to fix the configuration space. And this is maybe something slightly different than what you might expect from, um, well, classical mechanics context. Uh, so, so this is just, just going to be the space where, where your classical fields live. So uh, this is going to be the space of um, all field configurations. So, and I want this to be the space of smooth sections of some vector bundle over M. So this is some vector bundle. Um, and uh, I also want to consider the space of compactly supported sections. So this is EC. So this is sections with compact support. So sections with compact support. And in particular, I want to consider um, smooth compactly supported functions. So I use the notation D. The notation is uh, inspired by uh, the notation of Laurent Schwartz. Um, so this is not a coincidence. OK, um, and I want these guys to have topologies, uh, because in the end, uh, I want to be able to define some sort of calculus on these spaces. Uh, so I, I want to set up a framework for, uh, well, essentially infinite dimensional differential geometry, which is not as scary as you might think. Uh, and for that, uh, let me make a short excursion into uh, the literature again. So let's start with uh, this guy here. So the, these are... Uh, smooth uh, sections of some vector bundle. In particular, you could uh, consider the example of the scalar field. Where uh, this is just smooth um, complex value. Well, actually, I don't need complex. Smooth real valued functions on the manifold. And uh, well, this has a very natural uh, topology, and let me say a few words about it. This, this is not the main um, point here, but I think uh, since Stefan is going to talk about convergence, then uh, we, should, we should have some, some topology lessons. Um, okay, so 
here is a brief summary. Uh, one way of saying what topology I want to put there is to say uh, the compact open topology. So, um, and this is an example reference, uh, which is also good for infinite dimensional differential geometry. This is the book of uh, Kriegel and Mischer, convenient setting of global analysis. So if you want to find out more about a possible ways to, to, to define calculus and differential geometry, this infinite dimensional setting, well, this is one um, good reference. And uh, he says, well, the compact open topology uh, is given by a sub basis of maps, which map compact sets to open sets. So that's, I uh, hope you can see it well. So uh, yeah, compact open topology sub basis consists of sets of this form, K runs through compact and U runs through open. So that's a quick way of saying what's the topology on the space of all smooth functions. And then for compactly supported functions, a quick way of saying things is, well, you have uh, this, uh, oh, and this is a Frechet topology, by the way. You have this Frechet topology on the space of um, functions with a support in a fixed compact, and then you take an inductive limit over all compacts. So that that is, uh, the very abstract way. Now, if you want something more explicit, you can look up, uh, well, the standard reference as well. There is the functional analysis of uh, Rudin, where he goes into details on that as well. So C infinity of uh, omega is smooth functions on an open, and this DK is smooth compactly supported functions, uh, well, smooth functions supported in K. Uh, K is a fixed compact. Okay, and then, uh, well, he defines it more explicitly in terms of a family of semi-norms, and he shows that this is a countable family, so uh, you actually obtain a fresh topology. Yes, is there a question? No, okay. Um, so, so yeah, so, so you, can, you can look this up. Um, and then uh, as for the topology of the smooth compactly supported functions, uh, again, yes, hello? Yes, sir, so uh, it, ah. time to, to switch on the microphone. Um, so you say that this Frege topology, uh, which is uh, of, of the E and basis, are in fact compact open? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, compact open topology is something much more general, <laughs> um, but in this case, um, because it coincides with the compact open topology. For continuous functions, but I may be, I'm not an analyst, so. so yeah, I mean, you, you, can, you can do it on the space of continuous functions, but you can also do it, uh, well, so, uh, so, so, so the compact open topology that, that you use uh, on the space of continuous function um, coincides with uh, this Frechet topology, which is explicitly uh, described here. It's just the same topology. I mean, the space of smooth functions is in particular, uh, you know, uh, continuous. So the compact open topology can be, I mean, you, you can do it everywhere, right? It's not, um, it's, it's a very, very yeah, general thing. Just the, just the fact that there are um, partial derivatives appearing, which are not appearing in the compact open topology doesn't spoil. Yeah, yeah no, because, because this, uh, so, so this description here is specifically for the space of smooth functions um, on an open subset of Rn. So this is more specific. Okay. So this is a special case. So this is not true in general that uh, for, you know, if you were, uh, yeah. It's not true in general, it's true for this case. Um, so, so yeah, this is, in this case, this is a very explicit way of describing it and indeed, I mean, this is what you might think is a reasonable thing to do to define seminomes that are uh, given in terms of uh, 
well, the, 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 the maximum um, over the values of, of all uh, partial derivatives over a compact. And then, uh, yeah, so, so this is then how you, uh, you can define this family of compacts. And then uh, you obtain this countable family of seminomes, and then you obtain your, your Frechet topology. Uh, so, so, so this is, again, the standard uh, choice for the space of smooth functions on, um, on a manifold. Right? I mean, this is for open in our end, but obviously this generalizes to a manifold. Um, and then uh, for um, the space of smooth, Compactly supported functions. This is not a Frechet, uh, and you can see it either uh, as an inductive limit of Frechet spaces where you have fixed support, or you can um, just give it explicitly again as Rudin does. So, so this is the definition uh, you might want to look at. Uh, and another useful reference if you're if, if you want to do distributions the, the, uh, the hard, hard, hard way, so starting with all these topologies and so on, uh, then the book of Kutte is, is a great resource for you. So um, he starts with all the abstract story about topological vector spaces, then introduces these topologies and goes into uh, spaces of distributions. So you, you might have learned about distributions without doing any of this, but then it means that you did it wrong because the right way to do it is, is to um, go, go through all that abstract business. Um, okay, so, so that's just for those of you who are interested on, in, in that uh, side of things. Um, any more questions? So you're saying that if the manifold is not compact, then the compactly supported functions on it are not for shape. Correct, yes, because th th this inductive limit doesn't preserve that property. Okay, so it's not something like, because I imagine that if you have a countable family of semi-norms and then you have a countable amount of compact sets that may be generated somehow that you can still get a countable number. Of yeah, well, that, yeah, so, so that, that so, so you have to think of, uh, yeah, you have to think of, of this as, uh, you really have to take all compacts for this inductive limit. And, and that, uh, yeah, and, and that kind of ruins things. <laughs> um, so, so, so yeah, that, that, that space is kind of nasty. I mean, all, all, smooth, all smooth functions are, are good. And, and they have very nice properties. This this space has less of nice properties, surprisingly. So um, yeah, that, that's that's kind of unfortunate. Uh, any more questions? All right. So so let me go uh, back to the lecture, sorry, lecture two. So I set this up and this is essentially because I want to uh, define what does it mean to, to be a smooth function. So obviously there some, some, some topologies are needed. Um, and yeah, so first of all, let me say, uh, what does it mean to be differentiable? So a functional F from E to uh, well, let's make C is differentiable at phi if, uh, well, so we define the derivative as uh, the Frechet derivative. So the derivative, uh, first derivative at point phi in the direction of psi is defined as the limit t going to zero, one over t, uh, f of phi plus t psi minus f of phi. So if this exists, first of all, um, so for all um, psi in E, and 
uh, well, so uh, we might want to know what does it mean to be continuously differentiable. So uh, let's state this as well. It is continuously differentiable. And this is where, where you can have different definitions. So um, on Banach spaces, everything's the same. Uh, but here, when we go into Frechet spaces or even more general business, that, that's not going to be the case. So um, there are choices of uh, smooth calculus or you know, differential geometry settings. Um, and you, one has to uh, make a choice. Um, so I'm, I'm following uh, the, the approach of uh, Bastiani, which <laughs> is similar to, well, it, it, it is, it's all kind of evolved. So uh, there is the um, Michel uh, Milner uh, and, and so on school. Uh, so, but I think this, this particular formulation is uh, due to Bastiani. And um, Eva said that we should celebrate female mathematicians. So um, Bastiani was actually a female mathematician and this, this is a very nice contribution. So yeah, let's, let's name it after her. Um, so it is con continuously differentiable in the sense of Bastiani. If the map going from, so, well, essentially, uh, let's say, at, uh, no, I did. Okay, so this is, it is continuously differentiable, let's say, in the neighborhood U of phi in the sense of Bastiani, if the map, the map which assigns to phi and psi this derivative. Okay, and this is the map, and this is important bit from u cross e to complex numbers is continuous. And, and here the topology on the product is the product topology with respect to the product topology. Okay. So that's that's essentially uh, it. Um, now, in particular, uh, well, so now you can iterate this and get uh, the notion of what does it mean to be infinitely many times uh, differentiable. So from this follows notion of smoothness. And I'm going to be interested in exactly the smooth functionals on the space of configurations. So uh, we take the space of C infinity from E to C. So smooth functionals. Okay, and I would differentiate things many times. Uh, so so that, that's why it's smooth, right? I, I, there will be uh, situations where uh, you really do have to uh, take infinitely many derivatives. So, so this is not an overkill. Um, and uh, yeah, so with that, well, there is, there is a bit of, uh, there is a bit of uh, work you have to do to, to maybe, you know, prove various properties of, of this calculus. But essentially, uh, it is very similar uh, to um, what you're used to in, in the finite dimensional setting, especially if we stay with Frechet spaces. So because uh, E is a Frechet space, uh, this is going to make things as nice as, 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 as possible uh, away from Banach. Um, so we are in, in the good, good scenario. Um, and I guess maybe later on, I will uh, put some references in, into the file so you can look at more detail if you want. Sorry to interrupt, uh, just a short question. So when yes. you 
in this Bastiani definition is uh, is there um, do you impose linearity in in psi? Uh, well, I mean, it is being imposed <laughs> sort of by the definition, right? Of course, even in in in, in finite dimensions, you can have uh, well, this exists, but it's, it's not linear. Well, it, right. So, uh, well, let, 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 let's see, right? So, uh, derivatives. Uh, well, I, I don't know what you mean. It's not linear. Like, so. So, what's the example you're thinking about? <sighs> I don't. Der know. Over x squared plus y squared, and zero at the origin. These these funny examples. Oh, these funny examples. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh huh. These, okay. These uh, derivatives yeah. along the curves are defi defined, defined, but, but yeah, okay. In your way. Ah, okay. No, um, no. This this will end up being linear. So so in in particular, actually. Uh, well, so Sebastian said that this example wouldn't be continuous. So then perhaps linearity is. Somehow implied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 th but this is a very good point because uh, some things can go uh, go go strangely. So, um, there are other choices of calculus. For example, you could choose uh, the convenient setting um, of of Mischer and Kriegel, where you can have smooth maps that are not continuous. So, pathologies like that could happen with other choices of calculus. But but in, in the Bastiani setting, smooth maps are continuous. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> um, so and and the derivatives are also continuous. So that's great. Uh, but yeah, that there are some pitfalls. So so one has to be uh, a bit careful. So it's not 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 entirely obvious. So th thanks thanks for the question. Uh, so yeah, but but here in particular. We have a very nice uh, statement that uh, the nth derivative of a functional at a point uh, is a multilinear map on uh, E and actually can be seen as a distributional section of um, exterior tensor product of my vector bundle over M N, so so this notation here means uh, distributional sections so the dual of uh, the space of sections so uh, and and again uh, remembering that dual things kind of have um, the opposite behavior with respect to supports. So uh, gamma is all smooth sections. So gamma prime is compactly supported uh, distributions. So there is always, uh, yeah. So if, if one is not compactly supported then the other is compactly supported in the dual. This is kind of obvious because the pairing is, is the integral of one with the other. Um, okay, so that's a nice thing. And uh, there are also some uh, important classes of functionals. We usually don't take all the smooth ones. This is a bit too much. So there are some subclasses of functionals that we are going to be interested in. And uh, I want to mention three. <laughs> there is another one which I'm not going to mention. Uh, important. Uh, classes of functionals. Okay, so first one is something which might be familiar to people. So this is local functionals. Okay, so in simple terms, it means that uh, your functional can be written as an integral over M of some function on the jet bundle that depends only on the finite jet. 
And here you uh, integrate with uh, the volume form given by the metric, I could just denoted by d mu. So this here is cave jet, and this is the volume form. on M. Okay, so that's local functionals. This is something that physicists use a lot, uh, both classical and quantum settings, so uh, not very scary. Uh, by the way, uh, this space, so this, um, well, this assignment of functionals to uh, local functionals to uh, opens is a sheaf. So note, by the way, this is a sheaf. So you can talk about the sheaf of local functionals, which is nice. And there is uh, another class, which is the multi-local functional. So all the finite sums of finite products of locals. So, so this is like a algebraic closure of local functionals under the pointwise product. So this is multi-local functionals. Functionals. So this is uh, algebraic closure of F lock under the pointwise product. So F pointwise product G of phi, this is just the product of F of phi and a G of phi as complex numbers. Okay, and this doesn't, this is not a sheaf, uh, but for those of you who might have heard about factorization algebras and something called the device topology, this is actually a sheaf with respect to that topology. So uh, note, by the way, that this assignment is a sheaf in nice topology. So again, if you want to find out more, I send you to uh, my paper with Owen William or any of uh, you know uh, works of Costello William on uh, factorization algebras in quantum field theory. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's two classes of functionals. There is the third one, and this is regular functionals. Regular means very nice. Regular functionals. So. So I said that derivative of uh, a functional can be, well, is always a distributional section. So what's nicer than distributional section? Well, obviously, uh, you know, actual honest to goodness sections of some uh, vector bundle. So in particular, um, inside that space gamma prime, there is um, the space of uh, distributions with, uh, you know, no singularities. Uh, namely the space of things that are actually compactly supported sections. So a regular functional uh, has derivatives, all derivatives at all points are actually honest to goodness, compactly supported smooth sections. But now we have to be careful. We have to take the dual bundle tensor n over M N, and this is obviously uh, can be embedded into gamma prime of E tensor N over M N. So, and this has to hold for all N. You use the same letter for the dimension of M and for the N. The oh, do I? Uh, oh, I had the dimension. Oh, okay. Um, 
um, yeah, well, the, let's say the dimension of M is D. Oh, I put it. <laughs> um, Sorry. MA is the, uh, the Cartesian product, no? Oh, ah, I see. Oh, oh, okay, sorry. So, what was what was the misunderstanding? The misunderstanding is that I didn't see that you used the box tensor product over the Cartesian product of M. So I yes. thought that it was the dimension. Oh no 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 no! That's not the dimension. That's the Cartesian product. Yes yes. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think I introduced uh, the uh, letter for the dimension of M. So. Yeah. Now I understand. Thanks. Okay. Good, good. Um, okay, so, so that's a very nice assumption because that, that uh, allows one to uh, avoid a lot of um, functional analytic details on, on the first run. So uh, I'm, I'm going to, to use that assumption to, to simplify uh, some things, at least for the exposition. Okay, what else do I need before I uh, get rolling? Uh, so there is also well, okay, maybe <laughs> I, I went a bit uh, too fast here. So I started to talk about how to assign uh, functionals to uh, regions without telling you how to do that. So, so, so let me use the fact that I have um, a tablet and insert one definition that actually belongs here. So in order to make sense of, uh, well, localizing functionals in uh, regions, I need to introduce the notion of a support of a functional. So space-time support, right? Because that just, I mean, we could also think of the support of F as a function on E, but that's not what I mean. I mean the space-time support. So space-time support of a functional f, and let's take a smooth one, although it also holds more generally, is defined as follows. So the support of f is all x in m such that for all neighborhoods open of x, um, there exist some configurations phi and psi with the support, sorry, there's, there's my clock, uh, with the support psi in U, such that F of phi plus psi is not equal to F of phi. So if F was linear, this would be exactly the definition of the distributional support. Uh, for general F, it's a sort of, um, well, statement where this functional is sensitive to uh, perturbations around a given point. Um, and maybe another useful thing in this example, this support would be the same as the space-time support of that function on uh, the jet space. So, um, and so another thing which is maybe not immediately clear, but um, it's a sort of uh, follows from the definitions that, uh, the function, well, let's see. Uh, maybe we have to assume it extra. So I will assume it extra. Um, I will assume all functionals to be uh, compactly supported. So uh, let's assume everybody to be compactly supported. Compactly supported. So, so uh, one can show that this support is actually a closure of uh, the union of supports of 
um, the first derivative over all the points. So uh, let's see, there is a result. Again, I'm not going to prove it, but the support of F is actually equal to the union pi in E, the support, and now this is actual distributional support of these derivatives and the closure taken. Um, so yeah, each, each of these supports is compact, but the whole thing might not be compact. So uh, we have to assume the compactly supported extra. Okay, so that's the way we localize things. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's uh, essentially it about uh, the sort of kinematical structure. Uh, are, are there any questions to this point? Because maybe that's a good way to pause for a second. No, okay, I will carry on then. Uh, so the next stage is to introduce some classical dynamics. And for that, I'm going to uh, use a Lagrangian framework. Uh, but well, with some modifications. So uh, the first thing we um, notice when we uh, work on globally hyperbolic manifolds is that they are not compact. They're just not compact. And uh, that leads to a lot of complications. And, and the primary complication here is that if I want to define uh, the action, you know, as one does in classical dynamics as um, the integral of, of the Lagrangian density over the whole uh, space time, well, that, that's not a great idea because uh, that wouldn't be well defined at all. So uh, there is a bit of a workaround uh, where one has to um, try to stay uh, with compactly supported things. Uh, but yeah, but, but have uh, definitions of objects which are uh, not compactly supported. So, so that, that probably doesn't tell you anything yet. So, let me start with a definition which maybe makes things a bit more clear. So I, I want some uh, generalization of, of a Lagrangian that would work in that setting. So this is a generalized Lagrangian. Um, sorry, we were not very creative. Uh, generalized Lagrangian uh, is a map. So something like Lagrangian with a cutoff. So it's a map from the space of smooth compactly supported functions to local functionals such that, and here we have properties. So the support of L of F is contained in the support of F. And well, Okay, that makes sense that the support of this functional is governed by the support of the cutoff. And there is a fun property, uh, which is almost linearity, but not quite. So if I have uh, F, G, and H, three uh, compactly supported functions, such that the support of F does not intersect the support of H, then this uh, splits as follows. So there is F plus G, there is G plus H and minus L of G. And obviously if L was linear, then uh, this would uh, be true. This property essentially says that L depends on this cutoff locally. So uh, this is uh, just a more abstract way of saying it. And an example, so you don't Sorry. think, yes? What does this have to do with a cutoff? In what sense cutoff? 
f is a cutoff for the Lagrangian. Okay, cutoff is in uh, fixing some region of. Yeah, let me let me show you the example. So maybe that becomes clear. You tell me if it's more clear. So, um, L, so this is the example for the free scalar field, where we have uh, f, and then we have the usual uh, Lagrange density for uh, the free scalar field. Okay, so so that that's why f uh, works as a cutoff because naively you would like to put f equals to one, then you would have the standard uh, action, which doesn't make sense because uh, so 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 this would um, act as uh, a cutoff for this Lagrangian. Does it make sense now? Okay, cool. Um, so, so no, but 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 this is silly, right? I mean, we don't want anything to 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 depend on that cutoff, especially our equations of motion, and this is dealt with with the following definition. So, the Euler-Lagrange derivative, which is the important guy, derivative dl. So, so this actually is going to be a nice, honest to goodness, uh, one form uh, on E. So it's a one form on the configuration space, one form. And what, so, so that, that, you know, the um, notation is suggestive here, is defined as follows. So dl of phi. Um, so so right. So so as uh, one form, this is an element of uh, the dual. So dl of phi is going to be an element of uh, the space of distributions. So h is a compactly supported configuration, and this is defined as the variational derivative, so the honest to goodness derivative of L of F in the direction of H. And here's the important bit where F is identically one on support H. So we imagine the situation we want to compute uh, this Euler-Lagrange derivative in the direction of H, which is compactly supported. So we can choose the cutoff with a larger support and such that F is equal to one around the support of H. So this is F identically equal to one because L is local. Um, that's enough to ensure that this definition is independent of the choice of the cutoff. So locality of L, this implies that this does not depend on the cutoff. And I'm going into this trouble because, well, uh, on one hand, uh, we could probably start with this one form and do a lot of things with it, but uh, there is some nice stuff uh, in BV formalism that you actually do on the level of uh, Lagrangians themselves rather than uh, the one form uh, that you get from the Euler-Lagrange derivative. So, so I, I want to introduce all of it systematically. Uh, okay, but so, so with this uh, caveat now, if you're just interested in the equation of motion, uh, you can just take this one form and uh, run, run away with it. So the equation of motion of motion is the condition that dl of phi 
equals zero. So in other words, the space of solutions for my theory is a zero set, uh, the zero locus of uh, the L. So space of solution of solutions. ES or actually EL because this is what I'm using or maybe ES for the solutions. Uh, well, let's say ES for solutions uh, is uh, the zero locus of the L. I see a question. Um, oh, um, right. So C is there. So the question was, why is uh, this in EC prime? Uh, the C is there because uh, the uh, variation here has to be compactly supported. So I couldn't play this trick for uh, a variation that uh, was not compactly supported uh, because uh, then I wouldn't be able to choose the cutoff so that it's equal to one on a sufficiently large region. So this definition makes sense for uh, variations which are compactly supported. So DL of phi naturally lands in the dual. Um, so uh, it's a distribution, but it's not a compactly supported distribution. So, so that's why. So, so the, uh, the space is larger. Uh, oh, um, no, uh, that doesn't necessarily follow. Um, well, yeah, so, okay, maybe I, I did it a bit uh, too fast. Uh, yeah, so, well, this is how the L is defined. Uh, and it, it turns out that this actually also coincides with, uh, well, how one uh, defines uh, the tangent and cotangent space on E so that, um, so that DL is indeed uh, a one form. So, so maybe let me make uh, a small remark here. So uh, it turns out that, uh, well, a good way to put a manifold structure on E is, uh, well, to actually use the space of compactly supported configurations. So, uh, yeah, so the cotangent space is then exactly EC uh, dual. So uh, this is a good choice. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is actually a good choice of uh, the manifold structure. It's not a unique choice of the manifold structure. You could also uh, say that the tangent space um, is E itself that would lead to uh, a smaller space of uh, um, cotangent vectors. So, uh, but the, the choice I'm uh, using here to make that statement is this choice. So sorry for not stating that explicitly. Okay, that, does, does this make sense now? Okay, cool. Um, right, so uh, huh, I, I, got, I got completely confused about the timings of things. So um, sh should I be finishing right now? Is, is that it or? Um, in two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, right. So, so let me just say what I'm going to do next. Uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, 
I probably didn't uh, really uh, schedule enough time for, for classical theory. So uh, next lecture, I'm still going to, to do classical theory. Um, and then uh, quantization is actually going to take less time. So tomorrow, uh, Oh, really? Um, so tomorrow I'm going to uh, tell you how to describe the space of uh, solutions in a, a cohomological way. So um, I'm, I'm essentially, so if you're uh, familiar with uh, the derived uh, critical locus construction, then uh, this, this is a good, uh, Good guideline for what we are going to do, but I'm going to do it more, more explicitly. So I want to describe the space of solutions. Um, first of all, algebraically, so I can maybe state this now. So functional description. So I'm actually interested in the space of functionals on uh, the space of solutions. So these are functionals on the space of solutions. And this is a quotient, all the functionals uh, quotient by F0. And this is uh, functionals that vanish on the space of solutions. The space of solutions. And I will uh, then uh, construct uh, a differential graded algebra, which will have that portion as its uh, zero um, cohomology. And in, uh, in, in that differential, uh, in the differential graded algebra, uh, there's also more information than that. So um, it will also have information about the symmetries. And this is going to segue into, uh, well, symmetries and how we deal with it in the V formalism. So uh, tomorrow, if everything goes well, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, overestimate how much I can say in a day, uh, I will uh, finish the classical theory and then um, finally we get to quantization. So this whole setup is uh, to, to prepare our way for quantization. All right, um, that's it for now. Um, any questions to finish off? Wait, we have to follow the protocol. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Are there any questions? In the chat, perhaps somebody out there. Well, there were questions during the talk, so I assume that not everybody is is sleeping, and it's getting a bit late even here. So, um, and and after after two coffees, I I can say I'm I'm fully awake. Okay. No yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, if no one is going to ask anything, I just. Go ahead. I'm still curious how you're like how I have to think about these topological star algebras that are also power series in H bar. Like, what is topological about it? Oh, um, okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, I can see your point. Um, so, I want uh, for for each power of H bar, each coefficient, uh, I want a topological algebra. So, so because there. Are, several levels of uh, functional analytic complication here. Um, yeah. So, uh, to, so, so I, I'm going to aim to construct things at each order in H bar, but at each order in H bar, I already have an infinite dimensional space with structure. Uh, so in order to define even uh, these uh, products or brackets uh, on the level of formal power series. Uh, even for that, I'm, I'm going to 
need to, to differentiate these functionals, these things that are infinite dimensional. I mean, at the moment, we don't touch a power series yet because in the classical theory, we don't have to. Uh, so, so this story is, is um, you know, no, no edge bar in the room. Uh, but then for, for quantization, we have to start with, with this classical theory uh, already with some topological baggage, even to be able to construct things at each order in edge bar. And, and this is already some sort of non-trivial non functional analytic uh, construction, which I'm, I'm not going to give enough justice because there's not enough time. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, unfortunate that even at this level, uh, one encounters technical issues. Um, and but this is not this is not just just me. Um, in 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 the Costello William approach, if you look into Kevin's book, uh, they, they encounter essentially the same um, you know functional analytic issues in in their construction. So this is something that I would say uh, there is no easy way to go around. <laughs> But thanks for the question. Yeah, but you so you really but you I'm not sure if they do anything with observable algebras that are also topological algebras or do they? Oh they um, use they use this convenience setting. Uh, yeah. Well I don't I don't know well, how much fuss they make about it, but uh, there is there is the whole whole appendix about uh, you know these various uh, topologies and yeah, yeah. so uh, I'm 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 not using the convenience setting because I, I feel very uh, nervous when things are smooth but not continuous. Yeah. Um, so, but um, you, you could also use the convenience setting. That, that's why it gave that reference to, to Michel's book because uh, that, that's also valid. It depends, you know, how, how, how much discomfort you're able to deal with. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Are there any other questions? Hopefully. No. So let's thank the speaker again. And I'm going to close this uh, today's session. And all the students are